this presentation is really an extension of what Elliot Fishman was talking about this morning. Um, Mike actually, last week or two weeks ago, he paid me really the ultimate compliment uh, at work. He came to, uh, over to FPO, faculty practice, where I work predominantly, and I was potchking around on the workstation, and he said, every time I come in here, you got your face buried in that workstation. And that's right. It is true. And I live off of the number of cases that I read. And yet, I, I truly believe, like Elliot, that if you're really going to use the, de the multi-detector CT scanner that you paid over a million dollars for, if you're just going to do that to look at axial slices, you can get an extremely good deal now on a single slice scanner, probably less than for an ultrasound machine. So unless you're really going to use that scanner, why bother? Once again, my financial disclosures, uh, Siemens Medical Advisory Board, and my consulting arrangement with EZM. During this talk, I'd like you to understand the value of isotropic voxels. I hope uh, to show you how multi-detector CT can generate images which exploit the value of isotropic voxels, and then really rapidly run through the specific protocols which we use in our practice with attention to workflow, image management, and diagnostic impact. So multi-detector, what, what, what's all this about, right? You know all this. It's, you get fast imaging over large anatomic regions. Mike showed you the whole abdomen and pelvis in six seconds with a 64 detector scanner with no respiratory motion whatsoever. The voxels, depending on how you set your detector configuration and the speed of your acquisition, get very close to isotropic resolution and you get lots and lots and lots of slices. And how do you deal with those? So first, the isotropic voxel. That's a voxel with equal resolution in the X, Y, and Z axis. And today's clinical systems produce slices that are near isotropic voxel uh, resolution, a little bit of broadening in the Z axis, but for the most part, they're very, very close. And what that allows you is no loss of the relationships or resolution in any conceivable plane of imaging to acquire that volume of data. So just a, a quick schematic, with a single slice machine as the patient is moving in the Z direction, while your uh, X, Y um, relationships are preserved, notice that the slice becomes thicker and this is what we call slice broadening. So even though your collimator may be set for a five millimeter slice, if that patient is moving through as a pitch of two, your effective slice width is quite a bit larger than that and hence you get blurring. With a multi-detector CT scanner, that same slice is composed of multiple voxels, each of which are very close to being cubes, and therefore that interprets the, uh, that improves the overall imaging appearance. So if you take the same area with a single slice scanner, this is great. You got the duodenal sweep, you got the pancreas, the vessels, but notice how much sharper it is in the same area, different patient, utilizing multi-detector technology. And it's specifically because this image at the same slice thickness is composed of multiple isotropic voxels. So as Elliot talked about this morning, and I have to say, I give him total credit for inspiring me uh, and many other people, what we can do now is that we move beyond axial slices and we have a whole variety of tools in our toolbox by which to exploit the data that we have uh, obtained. We can use NPRs, curved, shaded surface, MIPS, and all the way up to volume rendering, which allows us to extend our evaluation from diagnosis to total disease visualization. And you've seen multiple examples already today in the different lectures of how we've moved beyond diagnosis. We can localize, show the relationship of abscesses, vessels, et cetera. And I just want to run through that in a more formal manner. So just going through the different types of algorithms that we have, uh, multiplanar reformat, that's simple. It uses the CT contrast scale. Obviously, it's limited to the reconstruction planes. Now, there are a number of papers that were presented at the RSNA and that are going to be coming out. I think there are two or three of them next month, which talk about the value of direct coronal imaging. And that's fine. You can prescribe a preset plane. The tech can knock off a set of coronal images in any plane or any slice thickness you want, but that doesn't totally leverage the full value of your scanner. We can use a curved NPR. I illustrated this case to you previously. We can uh, center the reconstruction along any plane that we want and kind of lay out a tubular structure or a vessel. This is particularly good for looking at stenoses, uh, particularly in the iliacs uh, and on peripheral CTA. 
Um, it's good for vessels and ducts, but it is limited. You can get a range of NPRs parallel to your central uh, axis, but even still, you don't have interactive ability with that data set. Um, excellent depth cues. It's great for CTA, for bone work, for CT colonography. Um, most of the, at least the Siemens equipment actually uses a shaded surface display to display the types of findings. Um, as it, we talked about, unless you, you know, you may over or under create stenoses, you don't really get textural information and you're not using all of the data set. One of our residents, Anuj Tolia, uh, actually created this one night in a pelvic trauma case and he was able to show this little pseudoaneurysm of the femoral artery uh, while on call. The MIP 3D displays are great, as Elliot illustrated, for looking at angi angiographic renderings. They project the brightest pixel along the ray of sight, and, uh, pre and therefore they're great for vascular displays. Um, they may mask intraluminal defects. Elliot showed you examples of how you can lose thrombi and stenoses within a MIP. They have no depth cues, so uh, you get sort of an optical illusion. You really don't know where these vessels are in relation to the data set. The brightest stuff tends to look to you that it's more forward, and the darker stuff uh, looks more backwards. Notice uh, in this particular image that there are no bones. There are now excellent bone segmentation algorithms available which can eliminate that and MIP is a lot more valuable. And finally, uh, the mini MIP display, again, instead of looking at the brightest pixel, you can look at the darkest pixel, and I illustrated this to you also. Uh, excellent for looking at the pancreatic duct, the common duct, the pancreas divisum, uh, and many chest radiologists now are using this in analysis of the bronchi uh, in, in chest CT work. But really, the major advantage now that the technology and computer software has given us, and this is available with most vendors, is the ability to create volume rendered 3D images. Here we incorporate the entire data set, we preserve the dynamic range of contrast so that the image looks very similar to a uh, CT image, although there's, um, this is not a CT image, this is rendered by brightness and opacity of tissues. You get improved relationships between the viscera and the vessels and the opportunity to interact with this in a uh, in interactive manner on a 3D workstation. So how might we actually now kind of take these uh, tools and bring them into our clinical workplace. So if this is a scanner, we have our different acquisition modes, and we set our collimators to use the optimal thickness, the smallest detector configuration for all our patients, much like Elliot does. Traditionally, we might acquire this data, reconstruct it four by four, look at some four millimeter slices uh, for viewing and archiving. Those go to film or packs, and you know, you'll get beautiful axial images, and this is a very simple paradigm. On the other hand, if we took this and reconstructed it one by one, then we would have very thin section slices. These could go to 3D reading uh, or into a volume archive onto a 3D workstation, and then clinically relevant images could actually be archived onto film or packs. So let me switch over to the uh, workstation. And let me just show you how this kind of works in real time. Can we make that switch? So this is what you're going to see uh, in your practice on a typical workstation. Here's a variety of cases. And uh, this is, this will just choose this particular case. Um, just want to just sort of show you the ergonomics of how this works. And I can stand up here and talk to you and demonstrate this to you. It's really got to be pretty straightforward. So the way this thing comes down is automatically it's going to come down into a, um, a coronal plane. We can take this whole data set and rotate it. We can apply clip planes to this data set and we'll clip it along parallel to the feet. We can align the data to the feet and create, moving that slice thickness down now to, let's look, let's look at this at about a five millimeter slice, window it optimally, and then we can, um, I'm sorry, I just, I'm used to working with the keyboard with this, and then we can just uh, sort of melt through the data set, and we can look at this in a very similar way that we would look at our traditional axial images. 5 by 512 by 512 image quality. The image quality is good, yet we're still looking at this thing in 3D. So we'll go through the data set. We can examine it very nicely. And as we look, there's a cystic abnormality right there in the pancreas. So what can we do about that? Well, remember now we have an interactive data set, so we can come back 
uh, to the anterior plane, we can kind of localize that guy right over there. We can change to a mini MIP very easily, and then by rotating this image, uh, let's see, that's going to be over here. We can actually show very nicely the communication of this IPMT to the main pancreatic duct and make a diagnosis. We take a picture, save it, go back to the browser. Uh, there's the picture. We send it off to PAX, and there it is. It's all done. And, and it really doesn't take that much time, and it leverages the type of data that you collect for just this very reason. Okay, we'll go back to the presentation now. Thanks. There are a lot of other tools on that workstation now. I would urge you uh, to go, the, uh, the Siemens people are here. They can show you this particular workstation. There's some nice vessel analysis packages. There's a colonography package on there. Uh, there are some other types of 3D tools, and it works very nicely. But this workstation, or most workstations, it's really that easy. I mean, I can sort of stand up here in front of all y'all and do that and get a reasonable image. I'm not tweaking it for maximal optimization, but you see that even within the context of a busy practice, in the workflow that you do, uh, this is really relatively simple. So in the remainder of the talk, let me run through a bunch of protocols uh, that we use uh, and show you kind of from the needs of the referring physician and the capability of the scanner, how we can design a protocol that's going to bring the maximal value from our investment, our CT machine, our diagnostic instrument, to the referring physician to help him or her answer a specific question. <clears throat> In general, uh, we always give oral contrast, and Mike talked about this Previously, we'll use either the ReadyCat barium uh, in patients who may be going to the operating room, right lower quadrant pain, appendicitis, trauma patients, et cetera. We prefer water-soluble contrast, or we'll use neutral contrast. Uh, the presentation that Mike referred to in his uh, uh, talk that we gave at the RSNA last year is going to be in the January radiology, uh, which should be uh, in your wrapped in, uh, in plastic uh, on your desks, and you might want to take the plastic off next June and look at it. I'm just only, I'm only kidding. Um, we use, I, I like to use weight-based dosing for IV contrast. We use 300 uh, milligrams of iodine per milliliter. 1.5 ml per kilogram will generally give you an acceptable scan. We use saline flushes for all of our CTA work and our CT urograms. I like glucagon. Um, I, Believe, I, I can only tell you that a tenth of a milligram doesn't cost a lot, and it still improves the scans, even with a 64-slice scanner. You like to give the contrast at a pretty brisk, brisk rate if the IV can handle it. So just for an oncology patient, we want to stu study the liver in the portal phase. We want to have our arterial and vascular structures enhanced, and we want a reproducible data set. So we'll scan usually 80 to 90 seconds for a delay, assuming that the patient is reasonably intact cardiovascular-wise. Uh, we, we might use the wider detector for these patients to minimize the radiation, although more and more we're going to the 0.75 on these patients. We'll create a set of four millimeter slices. We may or may not use the coronal displays for these. These are two uh, interactive 3Ds of just some lymph nodes. I don't think there's really any diagnostic benefit in these two particular patients. Uh, to look at these nodes, you can see that they're calcified from a mucinous uh, carcinoma of the colon, which on other images was obstructing. Uh, here's a different patient with a huge mesenteric liposarcoma that was fistulizing into bowel. And for spatial relationships for a huge tumor like this, clearly the off-axis 3D displays are going to be uh, considerably helpful. But for the oncology patient in general, uh, we're, we're still pretty much in axial mode. As we get into other indications like abdominal pain or CT enterography, a patient for lower abdominal pain, roulette appendicitis, roulette diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel disease, appendicitis, diverticulitis, here we still want to look at our liver in the portal phase. We want to have our vessels enhanced. So we're going to scan at 80 to 90 seconds. We have our thin sections now, which are going to the workstation. Four millimeter axials will also knock off a set of four by four coronals, uh, which has some billing implications. And here are just a couple of examples. Here, uh, this is with positive contrast. Again, you can see this patient with diverticulitis. It's shown elegantly. You can see the reflections of the sigmoid colon. You can see the relation to the abdominal wall, separation of the small bowel, and you get a really nice display. 
Here's a patient with chronic SMV thrombosis utilizing neutral contrast material. You can see the target appearance of the wall of the small bowel. By turning a MIP rendering on this, you see that the large branch of the superior mesenteric vein, which drains the uh, right lower quadrant mesentery, is absent, and there's almost a cavernous transformation of that superior mesenteric vein chronic tiny little collaterals uh, which are draining the bowel and actually extending up along the portal vein. Same, virtually the same image, just a different imaging paradigm. And here's an older scan on this patient showing the SMV thrombosis. <clears throat> For appendicitis, again, there are a bunch of papers that are coming out next month and more presented at the RSNA showing the utility of coronals. This is a 3D display. You can see the appendix nicely. Here is a patient with right lower quadrant pain who was done with neutral contrast. I think it's very difficult uh, to diagnose appendicitis with neutral contrast. In fact, we put that as a major caveat in our paper, although other groups have, have claimed success. If you're going to use neutral contrast for right lower quadrant pain patients, you need to be prepared to look at uh, 3D rendered slices. So here you can see in this oblique image, you can see the cecum uh, and you can see the abnormal appendix back here. Uh, you don't really see the uh, abnormality. Uh, it's not going to stand out for you until you actually kind of rotate that image into the appropriate imaging plane. Sometimes uh, right lower quadrant pain is going to be due to colitis, obviously a non-surgical condition in this case, like Mike showed. Uh, again, you have this thumbprinted appearance indicative of submucosal inflammation. The nice thing about this is because you have a 3D volume set, you can look at other areas and you can see segmental non-connecting um, dilatation of the intrahepatic biliary tree. So not only were we able to diagnose this patient's colitis, but also predict that she also had primary sclerosis and cholangitis at the time of presentation uh, on the same imaging study. Mike talked about CT enterography. I just want to re-illustrate that point. Again, what we do here is we give the patients oral contrast, and this in my mind is going to be replacing the small bowel series for a whole variety of things. One of the concerns with CT enterography is the distinction of cystic masses from bowel loops. If you look at the bladder here, which is hardly filled with IV contrast, it clearly stands out against the contrast enhanced wall uh, of the small bowel. Here's a different patient. This one has a little bit more warm-up time, but once he gets going, it's an interesting patient who we did CT enterography on. And here you can see multifocal Crohn's disease. We'll be able to show you uh, really nice uniform distension of the small bowel, uh, giving the patients the contrast material at least two bottles drank rapidly in 30 minutes uh, while the patient is waiting a second half cup half bottle right before they get on the table. You get excellent uniform distension in virtually all cases. And with an interactive 3D workstation, you can show uh, areas of abnormality and make the diagnoses that are appropriate in these individual cases. And you can just see the way uh, you can kind of roll the data set back and forth to show the contiguity of the loops, to show uh, exactly where the stenoses begin, where they end, the multifocality, et cetera, et cetera. And I think there's obviously a lot of interest in this particular procedure. Um, and uh, actually, a lot of people that I talk to, the gastroenterologists in their institutions are driving it. Um, at Mayo, uh, they have actually used um, CT enterography as their primary diagnostic uh, imaging modality for uh, occult GI bleeding. If that's negative, they stop. If they find something, they work it up with a capsule. Um, in terms of GI bleeding and mesenteric ischemia, here we want to get a CT angio and the liver in the portal phase. We want an abdominal CTA. We want to visualize the bowel wall. So here we'll start a little bit earlier. We'll use our very narrow column de collimator detector to get an abdominal CTA. And then in phase two, this is our typical acquisition, which we uh, have used for our oncology cases. So now we're adding a CTA type of interaction. This was a case that Liz uh, Heck did last Monday of a patient with mesenteric ischemia. And you can see on this volume rendered uh, image that there's a focal stenosis of the superior mesenteric artery. You see it beautifully uh, on the volume rendered image. Here's another patient who had uh, GI bleeding mesenteric ischemia with a huge aneurysm of the, um, uh, of the gastroduodenal artery. You can see that even on the CTA using volume rendering, you still preserve the 
typical tissue characteristics of CT, and then you can isolate that aneurysm, show its feeding vessels. Of course, this can be interacted with, rotated in the appropriate clinical planes. Again, it's all the same patient, same acquisition, and the data really comes easily off the scanner. So we'll, we'll let people think about what, what is the possible diagnosis in this case. Here's a patient who's sent for an a thoracic aortic aneurysm. These two images were obtained during the exact same acquisition. This is not a delay. So we did a thoracic protocol. This is probably about 40 seconds after the injection. I'm sorry, this is probably about 20 seconds. This image is probably about 30 seconds after the initiation of the bolus. And what you see is portal venous enhancement of the liver. You generally don't see this until out to about 90 seconds. I remember Kevin Fillmore at one of our conferences just made this diagnosis, outstanding observation. What this is due to is actually a large mesenteric AVM. Uh, which you see here. So here's that same arterial phase acquisition. Here you can see the superior mesenteric artery, the AVM, the early filling of the portal vein, both in volume rendering and in MIP. Uh, again, a, a finding that was totally unknown at the time of the thoracic evaluation. Here's a patient that was sent to me from a former colleague who's been quoted all morning, Glenn Krinsky, who's now out in Ridgewood, New Jersey. This was a patient uh, sent for GI bleeding who had diverticular bleed, uh, and on these MIP renderings, you can actually see the vessels uh, coming off of the IMA branch supplying this bleeding diverticulum. Uh, there was a study um, that was done in pigs, actually, which suggested that CT can see an extraordinarily uh, slow rate of bleeding, something on the order of just a couple of millimeter, uh, milliliters per, uh, per minute. And it's highly sensitive, but we just haven't had really the tools to look at it. But now with uh, rapid acquisition, good bolus injections, six second acquisitions through the abdomen properly timed, I think we're gonna be able to make significant inroads into the diagnosis of GI bleeding. And just one more case uh, from our place of a lady with occult GI bleeding, this is a MIP angiogram. Uh, from a abdominal data set done with a mesenteric ischemia protocol. So here you see the aorta, the iliac vessels. Here's the iliocolic branch of the superior mesenteric artery. Notice that there's an early draining vein right at this level and this tuft of vessels right here in the cecum, findings diagnostic of a cecal AVM. And I think more and more people are going to have examples of this as we go. Uh, I talked about pancreas in detail earlier this morning, patients who are jaundice, epigastric pain, gallbladder disease, a pancreatic phase, a pancreatic angio, a duct study, and the liver. So we have our biphasic injection that I went through earlier. I don't want to spend a whole lot of time on it. But again, here you can see uh, we get really a one-stop shopping where you have the mass, you have the vessels, we have the ducts, and a complete picture uh, in one uh, examination. In our patients who are cirrhotic, who have known or suspected hepatomas, abnormal LFTs, masses diagnosed on other studies, we'll do a three-phase liver examination. We were interested in the density of the liver, the presence of arterial enhancing masses. We want a hepatic angiogram and a portal venous assessment. So we'll get non-contrast images through the liver to rule out fatty liver. We'll do a hepatic artery CTA where we'll bolus track. Uh, to the top of the aorta at 100 Hounsfield units, a minimum four milliliter a second uh, with thin sections scanning through the diaphragm to the crest. And then in a portal phase out at 90 seconds, again, looking for space occupying lesions. Some examples, here's a tiny little hepatoma uh, in this patient. You can hardly see it uh, on the portal venous phase. You can barely make it out, but clearly this is the kind of thing that you're looking for in a patient with minimal cirrhosis. Here's another patient, again, on the non-contrast. On the contrast-enhanced scan, you can barely see it. This is a little bit late, uh, so that's why it's not really standing out so well, but there is an area of hyper-enhancement right there, which becomes isodense during the normal portal venous phase. Um, again, you need these arterial phase images to rule out a hepatoma. Uh, we do CT angiography to show, to help the patients who are going to undergo transcatheter chemoembolization. Here's a patient with a large hepatoma. We can see it's invading the portal vein. There are periportal collaterals uh, running through the liver in this particular individual. Here's a patient with these bizarre findings with abnormal LFTs, which on the volume rendered angiogram are actually multiple small hepatic artery aneurysms. So again, we have that information. And then we have this case 
Uh, this is a fascinating case. You look at this and we, we thought first, is it FNH? No, it's a little too irregular. Is it uh, maybe a fibrillomalar hepatoma? I think she's a 25-year-old girl who was referred with this mass. Clearly looks like it's in the liver. Here on the venous phase, it looks like it's bowing the IVC. But as we begin to do our hepatic angiogram on this patient, notice that the hepatic artery is normal and there's no blood supply to that mass. So here again, just off axis, there's no blood supply to this mass from the hepatic artery. But as we sort of rotate around, we actually found this little vessel coming off the aorta, which we could triangulate to with the 3D and actually show that the blood supply to this mass is not coming from the liver, but directly from the aorta. This patient was resected. Here you can see this little branch again supplying this big thing. And this turned out to be a primary retroperitoneal neuroendocrine tumor, not a hepatic mass. We do a large number of transplant patients, and these patients really stress the capabilities of a multi-detector CT scanner. So here we're looking at the liver density. We need liver volumes, arterial anatomy, venous anatomy, biliary anatomy, and uh, these always come in at like 5 o'clock, and I'm, I say, hey, they, so I've got to do this. But they're not, they're not that terrible to work up. So we do our non-contrast liver to get our volumes, hepatic artery, a portal venous phase, and then we do a CT cholangiogram use, using non-ionic um, biliary excretion agent with a 30-minute delay. And here's the kind of uh, images that we see with a 64 slice scanner. Notice how much further out into the liver you can see the hepatic arterial branches. You can do a pretty good job with a 16 scanner, but this is kind of beyond the real uh, abilities of a four slice scanner at this point. And these are some 64 slice uh, CTAs uh, that we performed. Again, you get excellent visualization. You can see uh, the branch to segment four. Um, which is going to be here, which is useful for the transplant surgeons. You can see anomalous supplies uh, from the uh, gastroduodenal artery in this particular case. Portal venous anatomy, here's a portal vein trifurcation. This type of anatomy is a contraindication to transplant. Hepatic venous anomalies, you show the hepatic veins very nicely. And here are the three of them, but as you come down, um, there's an accessory hepatic vein draining into the uh, IVC. This is a rather large branch draining the inferior portion of the liver, and it's certainly something that the transplant surgeon likes to know preoperatively. And then, of course, we have the biliary anatomy, which is key. So here you see these tiny little ducts, and this is typical of the patients that the ducts are really this small, um, and yet with a 64-slice scanner, you can really get a pretty good idea of what's going on. In this particular pace, case, she has a uh, transplant fatal anatomy in that her posterior branch of her right lobe actually hooks into the left common hepatic duct, and this is a trifurcation pattern. This patient is excluded from being a living related donor. Here's a case from the 16th slice scanner where we actually missed that. Patient went to surgery and actually at the intraoperative cholangiogram is where they discovered this trifurcation pattern. This is a real tragedy is you can imagine the psychological buildup that is necessary for the patient, for the donor, and everybody, and to have an aborted procedure is really a terrible thing. Elliot talked about the uh, CT urogram. I'll just give you our take on it. We do a renal stone. We get a parenchymal phase for the mass and the CT urogram. Non-contrast images. I like the parenchymal phase. Still, we find that that's a little more accurate for looking at vascular assess um, enhancement of many of these masses uh, and the CT urogram. We get it out at seven to eight minutes, and again, we use thin detector. Now, I've started giving Lasix. Uh, this works very nicely. If you give that, if you give the Lasix right before you get the non-contrast scan, you do the non-contrast scan, you administer 200 cc's of the 240 contrast material. It's very, it's much more dilute. You get a good volume. You give it three to four ml per second. You get your nephrographic phase at 90 seconds. After that, you give 100 ml of saline uh, over about a minute and a half, wait, and then get your urographic phase. You can get really exquisite urograms. Here's a patient with, uh, with a cystectomy and bilateral ileal loops. We have beautiful evaluations of the ureter. Here's another patient who has uh, idiopathic mid-ureteral ureteritis with really excellent depiction and a lot of level of confidence that in fact the ureter is filled and this is not just underfilling. 
Elliot has a case of uh, renal tubular ectasia. We got a case, again, with the uh, low density contrast material. You can get a really nice job in this patient with medullary sponge kidney. Uh, and then finally, this patient with an infiltrating transitional cell tumor uh, in the lower pole with segmental hydronephrosis. Again, um, all of this information is relatively easy. These are really very easy for me to do, and I agree with him 100% that I need to be sitting there doing these cases. I can't rely on the images as good as my techs are that they send me. Renal mass, we need a non-contrast, a renal angio for planning, a parenchymal phase for enhancement. So we have a triple phase acquisition, non-contrast, the CT angio, and the parenchymal phase. So here's an example from last week. Here's a small renal mass. The patient was being evaluated. This was known. He was being evaluated for surgery. So you can see the mass. Notice here on the CT angiogram that you can see a single renal artery supplying the lesion, but early uh, branching here, prehylar branching with a large vessel that actually on the MIP images could also be shown to be supplying that tumor. Very useful information to the laparoscopic surgeon. And then a delayed image to show the relation to the collecting system. This is abutting, it's pressing, but it's not invading the renal sinus. And this is a good evaluation for pre-op laparoscopic uh, nephrectomy. <clears throat> Again, with bone removal now, we're gonna be really good at looking at the renal arteries, same case. Uh, on a MIP with the bone, on a volume rendering without the bone, you can see very beautifully uh, the renal artery. So do you get paid for this stuff? I mean, at some level, um, you know, you like to do this, but Dr. Magwell, do you bill, do you charge, how do you get paid? So what we do is on all of our cases that do require 3D, which include our pancreas, our living-related donors, our renal masses, et cetera, et cetera, we add a CPT, CPT code modifier with the provision that the report will state specifically that 3D images were created on the workstation how, uh, as MIP, as volume rendered, et cetera, and how and where in the, in the body of the report those 3D images were used. So on a CT urogram, the urographic images reveal the calyces and collecting systems to be of normal configuration. There's no evidence of hydronephrosis, et cetera. And then some kind of imaging record must be exported to the PAC system or recorded on film. And with that, uh, we do fairly well in getting reimbursed for our 3D work. We're extremely uh, diligent about not charging patients for 3D on indications when 3D isn't done, but if 3D is done, these are ways to maximize your chances of becoming reimbursed for it. So when, when might we do 3D? Certainly we do it for CT angiography, CT colonography. I didn't talk about, certainly not with Mike here, CT urography. I would submit that all cases could be looked at in 3D. It's the way to really leverage the large volume of slices that you have. You can display diagnoses in a clinically relevant way. You can improve diagnoses, as Elliot showed you this morning, and I hope I gave you a couple of examples this afternoon. And again, we move from diagnosis to total disease visualization to treatment planning to management, et cetera. Challenges, interpretation, uh, integration of the workstation into the packs. I still got to flip my chair. I'm, I'm kind of like the little king in free cell, you know, that's got to kind of go back and forth uh, between my workstation and my pack station. Uh, what does a normal exam look like? What should a CT of the kidneys look like? Should it be a set of coronals? Do you need all the axials? What do you archive? What do you save? You know, and then getting radiologists trained on workstations. I think we're in an incremental phase of growth now. I think uh, at the RSNA, when I asked the question how many people are using workstations, about 25% in the audience talked about using them in most of their cases. Clearly, PACS integration, reimbursement issues are going to be a challenge. And then finally, training referring f clinicians to understand the 3D image, to accept the 3D image, I think will really be able to take uh, the tools that we're given and really move them in a positive direction for improved patient care. Currently at our institution, we send three millimeter thick coronal images to the PACs on abdominal pain patients and pancreas patients. And one could make the argument to do it for all patients because it's about another 80 images that you get in that coronal plane. So it's something that you can use in addition to your axial images if you don't have quick access to a workstation. All I can say is that 
I think for Dr. Malik, it's, it's very important for him to have that workstation, but has there been any studies that really have shown that having a workstation is going to improve your diagnosis? And, and really, as far as I am know that there's not, except for one or two papers that have been recently presented at the RSNA that showed that having coronal reformatted images presented to the radiologist on a PAX uh, gave the same accuracy as having access to a workstation. Maybe they don't have the expertise that uh, Alec has on those workstations, but uh, uh, while it's relatively easy, it's, you do have to be trained on it. I don't think you can just sit down at a workstation unless you know all the intricacies and tricks to doing it. Uh, he would like to make a comment. I mean, I, the bottom line on that is, again, what's your philosophy? If you just need to make diagnoses, you're probably going to be fine on axial slices. If that's all you want to do, why buy an MDCT scanner? If you look at the practices that have really integrated 3D imaging into their practice, and really Hopkins, Brigham, um, us at um, Cleveland Clinic, they will all tell you to a person that their volume has skyrocketed. So you can use it as a marketing tool, it seems you're trying to say, which is probably true. Maybe it's because they get better patient information. Are there other questions? Okay, yes, sir. The question was besides the Leonardo. Well, obviously, every vendor has their own workstation. We have Siemens equipment, but we also have Vital Images workstations scattered throughout our department. They've traditionally been used uh, very well for angiography and colonography. But all workstations are becoming very competitive, and uh, you know, we have also uh, the Voxar tools on the Philips, uh, which the residents really like at Bellevue. They say it's great for doing the trauma work. Um, I, I, you know, the the applications are becoming genericized, and it's really whatever user interface. But now most of them will accept images from anything. So. The question was volumen uh, and, and the problems that one may have in distinguishing filled loops of bowel from perienteric or interloop abscesses. You know, this is a potential problem. I think if you do have a workstation and you're able to really scroll through that data, it can be uh, relatively easy to distinguish those. But, of course, you look for the enhancement in the, in the continuity of the bowel loops, as, as Alec had pointed out. Yeah. In very thin patients, you can run, sometimes run into problems, I think, when you have neutral contrast on board. And, but right. I, I would stay away from it unless you're going to be doing 3D interactive or uh, multi-planar uh, multi display analyses. I mean, it, it really, because in the axial plane, it doesn't really add that much. It may actually detract. So you, you kind of have to see that case. Many of the cases of Crohn's with um, neutral contrast, you'll have hyper-enhancement of the adjacent bowel and it becomes really quite straightforward to see the abscess. And Mike, you'll, Mike showed you that lymphoma perforated and, it, you know, even the Crohn's cases look like that. So there's going to be a learning curve. It's not perfect. Um, I would venture to say that if you look back at your barium cases for the degree of uniformity of distension, you'll find that there's probably not, it's not quite as good as you thought it was. And so that could happen with barium. I think the bottom line is having access to a workstation, you know, is, is very important. And if, if, you, if you can use it, it can, it can be very helpful. You know, I, the, so the question was, um, once you get a workstation, once you get training, is it better? Uh, can the techs learn how no, to do it? saying before that. Oh, before. To just have to send coronals over. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, so the question, I'm, I'm sorry, I misinterpreted. Before you get a workstation, before you get trained, before you get turned into Elliot, um, can the text give you something that's reasonable that you can work with? Um, it, it really depends on the, for me, the anatomy. So, for instance, they do a great job in carotids, circle of Willis, um, most abdominal aortas, and things like that where the anatomy is relatively stable. Uh, where the anatomy is variant in the, um, like, you know, obviously in the abdomen, the bowel, uh, things like that, it just doesn't work as well. Where there's critical anatomy where you have to know how many renal arteries there are, if you're out of plane, you could miss small renal vessels. So you really want to be looking at that yourself. Um, 
the techs do a lot of the work in neuro, for instance, they do all of the temporal bone stuff, uh, all of the orbital stuff. So they, they, they got enough, uh, there's enough stuff for them to do. So we have stable anatomy, they can do a great job. I think where it's unstable or critical or preoperative, Again, we, we have our technology send coronals over to the workstation. I think it's been very helpful to a lot of my colleagues. And you know, we still read primarily off of Axial, but if there's a question having a coronal there, uh, it, it can be very helpful. So I would recommend that you at least do that. And it, it really doesn't take much effort on anybody's part. I mean, I, I went through that demonstration not to show off, but I, I, I well, sort of. But I did it to um, show you how really easy the user interface is. Uh, and it doesn't take a whole lot of extra time in terms of the diagnostic evaluation of, of a given case. Uh, so, and it just takes practice like everything else. 